I'm Sarah. I'm the Director of Restoration for the American Chestnut Foundation. I work out of our Penn State Research and Partnership Office. Uh, today we have Kendra Collins, who is the Regional Science Coordinator for New England, and she's based out of Burlington, Vermont. And Eric Jenkins, who is, uh, Eric, what's your official title? Um, tree Breeding Coordinator. Tree Breeding Coordinator at our MetaView Research Farms. Um, and you're joining us today from Tennessee? No, I'm at MetaView. Oh, you are at MetaView. You're at the offices yeah. of MetaView. All right, yeah. cool. Well, the Virginia. internet is the the, <laughs> the uh, internet is stable enough, so that's awesome. It, yeah, I can see you and hear you pretty well. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'm going to turn my screen and my uh, my my mute my screen off and my mute on. And Kendra, take it away. All right. Let me see if I can share the right screen here. All right, are you guys seeing a PowerPoint and nothing else other than my little floating head? Looks good. Okay, yes. cool. All right, well, thank you for uh, joining us this morning, guys. I'm happy to be here to talk about chestnut harvest and storage. Uh, I'm gonna be focusing on harvest activities and storage from more of a citizen science individual uh, standpoint, and then Eric's gonna tell us how they do it at, uh, at a larger scale down at MetaView. Uh, so, with that, the first thing that you know you want to be thinking about with harvest. Sorry, I gotta move this so I can actually see my slides. Um, is timing. So you've got this, you know, you've got a chestnut tree or maybe several chestnut trees that you you know you know are producing burrs and that you want to harvest. Timing is fairly consistent across the range. Obviously, it's going to be a little earlier in the south, a little later in the north, but. I don't, it doesn't seem that there's as much variation in harvest timing um, as there is in say pollination or flower development timing. Um, and some of that also may be that pollination, if you're gonna be doing controlled crosses, flower development is really critical to time properly. Harvest is a little bit more loosey-goosey, which is kind of nice. So usually end of September, beginning of October, give or take, um, you know, if we've got some, if you've got some cold nights, that can push things a little bit faster. If you are having a warm fall, you know, might work, might, things might go a little slower. You know, I think moisture, if it's been dry, it seems like that can kind of um, push things a little faster as well. Timing for harvest is important mostly because of wildlife pressure. It's not so much getting the nuts off of the tree at the perfect time. It's that you want the nuts and you don't want the squirrels or the blue jays or anything else to get them. So the two things that I typically look for in terms of picking timing are for any infertile burrs to either begin browning, opening, or dropping. Uh, as most of you are probably aware, chestnut doesn't pollinate itself. So if you have a tree that wasn't pollinated, everything's not going to be, you know, none of the burrs will be fertile. But even an open pollinated tree often will have a few burrs here and there that didn't get pollinated. And so those may turn brown and start falling uh, usually about a week or two. I think typically about two weeks before any of the fertile burrs are ready. The other thing is chestnut burrs for all of their spiky unfriendliness do open on their own and they form two seams that open the burr into like four parts. Um, and you'll start to see those seams form. The burrs may actually kind of start to cleave a little bit uh, at one end or the seam may actually even start to open a little bit so you can kind of peek in there and see what's going on. And so if you see any of that happening, uh, the burr starts looking a little bit different in shape, that's a good um, good indication that it, it might be time to, to think about getting out there to harvest. Uh, you can absolutely harvest burrs before they are fully ripe. In fact, I generally recommend that you do that if you want to get the nuts. Um, just like you can harvest a green tomato and ripen it on your windowsill, you can definitely allow the nuts to ripen inside the burrs. Uh, you just store them somewhere um, relatively safe and away from wildlife. Uh, and finally, you want to make sure you harvest off the tree if at all possible. Um, this is, you know, in part so that you get the nuts and you know which tree they came from. But also when you harvest off the ground, you can really open yourself up to a lot of issues with mold. And we'll talk more about that um, when we talk about storage. But there's several places in the process of harvest and storage where you can either open yourself up to issues or um, try to head them off at the pass. And it's a lot easier to store chestnuts without mold. <laughs> and once you have it, it's hard to get rid of. So anything you can do to prevent that is really helpful. As far as how to get at the burrs, you know, they're up on a tree. So there's a lot of ways that people uh, can do this. 
you know, the simplest, easiest, just grab and go kind of way to harvest, especially if your trees aren't too big, is to harvest from the ground with a pole pruner or some other long handle tool. Um, I like a pole pruner because you can, you know, they're extendable, you can snip off branch tips if they have a lot of burrs on them. Uh, if they have a saw attachment, you can use that saw to just kind of like flick the burrs off and then, you know, hopefully you have a, a partner in crime that can scamper around and, and pick them up so they're not staying on the ground for too long and, um, and you make sure you track which tree they came from. Uh, but, you know, folks can use painter's poles with a, you know, I've seen folks do that with a, like a homemade hook on the end made out of like a coat hanger. So there's, there's, a, there's many ways to, to use a long handled implement. Uh, if you've got a big tree to work with for volunteers, I typically recommend a bucket truck if at all possible. Um, the electric utilities are often really willing to donate their services, especially where harvest is typically pretty quick. Um, and what's nice about that is not only do you get a bucket truck often for free, you also get an operator that knows what the heck they're doing. <laughs> um, I usually, if I'm going up in a bucket truck that a utility is donating, um, you know, I usually have them steer me around. I just yell and point to where I want to go and, you know, they can thread a needle with those things. They're really, they're really good at it. And then I don't, I'm not the one jerking around the controls that I use once a year and um, I'm taking a ride that I don't want. <laughs> Tree services can also be willing to donate their service. Um, they're often a little bit more in it for, um, you know, to make money. It's their business. So they may not, may or may not be willing to donate their time, but they certainly have the resources and um, ability to get you up in a tree or to get up there themselves if you can tell them what to do. Uh, you can certainly rent a lift. Um, the, it, that can be expensive and a little bit time consuming to move around and set up, but it's certainly an option if, um, if you can't track down a bucket truck. Uh, you can work with a tree climber. Uh, we've done that several times. You know, if you're going to work with a tree climber, just I would recommend getting someone who's either a professional or at least professionally trained. Uh, you don't want them to get hurt and you don't want the tree to get hurt. So, um, you know, and obviously you're going to use that, you know, use a tree climber on a big tree. Um, you're not going to put them up in a little teeny orchard tree. And finally, I hesitated to even mention ladders because we've had, you know, we haven't had a ton of accidents with ladders, but when we have, they've been pretty bad. So I know some of you are going to use ladders. So I figure it's worth mentioning. Please, please, please be careful. Just be careful with ladders. Make sure that you, um, you know, feel comfortable using one. You know how to use one safely, how to set it up safely on uneven terrain. Uh, pay attention, have a spotter, um, and just, again, be careful. It's really easy to get up to the top and, and get engrossed in what you're doing and not um, necessarily remember that you're 15 feet in the air, but you are. <laughs> so um, that's it on ladders, be careful. So once you get all these burrs off the tree, the next step is shucking. And we'll talk a little bit about, I think I got a couple of slides on shucking. So, you know, if you've harvested your burrs before they're ripe, you're gonna wanna store them somewhere safe where they can finish ripening. And by safe, I mean somewhere that they're not gonna just be, you know, a banquet for whatever the local wildlife is. So, you know, don't put them in your woodshed, <laughs> but you know, your basement, your garage, sunroom, something like that is a good place to keep them. Um, you want to store them in something somewhat breathable. You know, don't leave them in a, in a plastic bag. Again, the mold issue, you don't, you want to allow some um, room for moisture to move around so that you don't get um, too much of it building up in, in moldy burrs and moldy nuts. So um, I usually keep them in brown paper bags or brown lawn and leaf bags. Some people use uh, laundry baskets, especially if you have a bunch of those, um, feed bags, you know, anything like that. But um, you know, I just want to store them somewhere where you can kind of paw through them every couple of days, check them to see if the nuts are starting to turn brown or if the burrs are starting to open easily. So again, remember they have those, those two seams that they should open along. And uh, once those become easy to open, that's usually a good indication they're ready to do that. So once that's, once it's time for the shucking to happen, you want to get on some good gloves and, and start shucking. I know Eric has a few slides on gloves. I think he's had some trial and error in his day, so I'm going to let him handle the uh, issue of proper gloves. Uh, what you're going to get out of your nuts when you shuck them are viable nuts, which are plump and fat, and infertile nuts, which are flat. So chestnuts produce three nuts per burr, typically. Sometimes you'll get these really funky burrs that'll have five or seven nuts or even more. You know, sometimes I think they've kind of like fused together and formed this one monster burr. 
Um, so you can get some funny things, especially the more you open. Uh, but typically you'll have either viable or infertile nuts. Um, if you can't tell by looking or you're not sure, you can use a float test to see which ones are viable. So you put the nuts in a vessel of water and any of those that sink are viable and if they float, they're not. So you can scoop off the ones that float and, and just pitch them. Uh, I often do this in like a big glass beaker because I have one, but you, know, you could use a bowl or a, you know, a um, container that you make you know, juice in or something. Um, and then you can also use like a 5% bleach solution to do this so that you get the double whammy of also surface sterilizing your nuts prior to storage. I figure as long as I'm putting them in a little bit of a bath, I may as well um, clean them up a little bit. Uh, and once you've done that, then you can count your viable nuts for storage. Uh, I count them in little groups of 10, and you know when I get to 200, I throw them in a bag. But you know whatever method works for you, um, but keeping good counts is, is definitely helpful. Okay, storage. So chestnuts are fairly perishable. Um, and so they're prone to drying out and they're also, they can get moldy. So proper storage is really important. You don't want the nuts to dry out. You don't want them to get moldy. So you wanna keep them cold, but not frozen. Um, and you wanna, you know, 34 is a good temperature. You know, I've run into folks occasionally who've said they've frozen nuts and they've, you know, germinated just fine. We experimented with that a few years ago and you know, some of the nuts come up, but you definitely get more that don't when they get frozen. So if you can keep your fridge really close to freezing, but above freezing, that's pretty helpful. Um, and then you want to monitor your temperature and moisture and the condition of the nuts every few weeks. You know, if you're going to start getting mold developing, if you notice it quickly, you can pull out a couple moldy nuts. Or if you don't look at them until April, um, you might have a bag of mold and then you're kind of stuck. Uh, the way I monitor, you know, so I use actually just a, I can show you, a home <laughs> refrigerator in my lab that's just cranked down a little bit. That's the, um, the tool I have. It's not the most um, fancy, but it was, you know, it works. Um, and then I have several thermometers in there that I can check. So every time I open the fridge, I can kind of, you know, keep an eye on where the temperature's at. We also, some of us have started using these Kestrel drop sensors, which are kind of neat. Um, they are Bluetooth enabled, so you can download temperature and relative humidity, at least for the ones that I, that I have. I, um, I think you can get them that just do temperature or that even take additional um, additional metrics, but you can just download those onto your phone or your computer and, um, and they'll take temperature readings as often as you want them to. Uh, so those are kind of neat and that's a nice way to see what fluctuation you're getting in your refrigerator. Uh, we even, even use them when we ship seeds or ship fungal plates to see what kind of temperatures they're encountering in shipment. Because uh, occasionally, you know, we've had folks worry that their nuts got too cold be, uh, being shipped in the spring or that their fungal plates got too hot being shipped in the middle of the summer. So these things are kind of kind of fun. You know, if, if you like data, they're a hundred bucks. Uh, so kind of kind of fun to play with. The standard method for nut storage for chestnuts is to package them in damp peat moss. Uh, damp peat moss means wet enough that it can form a ball when you squeeze it together, but not so wet that you can squeeze any water out of it. So you can kind of make like a little snowball out of peat. Uh, a 10 to 1 ratio of peat to water works pretty well if you'd rather measure it. Uh, peat is pretty hydrophobic. So when I'm mixing up peat for nut storage, I usually dump a bunch of it into like a, a tub, like a dishwashing tub, and I add some water and I mix it up kind of like bread dough. And once the water starts actually absorbing, I, you know, check my moisture level and, you know, either add more water or more peat to get it to that consistency. Uh, the nice thing with peat is that it's acidic and pretty antifungal, so it helps prevent rot and other fungal issues, but it also keeps the nuts moist so they don't dry out. So you can fill a Ziploc with your damp peat and the nuts. Um, you just want to kind of mix them all in there, make sure the nuts have a, a good amount of peat surrounding them. About 50 American nuts fit in a quart size bag, about 200 in a gallon. Um, you know, if you're working with big honking Chinese nuts, you're going to use you know, less per bag, but it's kind of a general, general rule of thumb. Uh, some people poke air holes in their bags, others do not. Both methods are successful. I typically squeeze out as much air as possible, almost like it's vacuum sealed, and just, you know, as long as the peat level was, or moisture level was okay, that seems to work well. Um, but some people swear by poking holes and whatever you're comfortable with. Both, both result in chestnuts that will sprout. 
Alternative methods, um, I haven't used too many of these, but I have heard or know people who have. So um, a lot of folks have actually started bulking larger lots of nuts in Ziplocs without peat moss. Um, and I think as long as you ensure that the nuts are clean before you're storing them, um, it doesn't seem to be a huge issue with mold. And the nuts generate enough moisture on their own that they don't seem to dry out. If you did this with like five nuts in a bag, you'd probably end up with five really dry chestnuts by the spring. Uh, some folks use sphagnum, which you can find either as green or sometimes brown, um, but uh, usually you can find that as sort of like a horticultural supplement or you know something to play with in terrariums. Uh, so you can use that. Uh, some folks like to store them outside as long as they're protected um, from wildlife, like they may bury them in the ground in a coffee can or something like that. Uh, I've never done that, but I know it's something folks have done, might store them in sand. And I've heard rumor that someone had, or that at least one person has stored them successfully in kitty litter. I have not tried that, uh, nor do I have any desire to, but there you go. Uh, the reason that we store them in the refrigerator, in, in addition to preventing them from um, rotting, because uh, unlike most nuts, you know, if you left chestnuts out on the counter, they're just going to dry out. They don't have enough fat to keep themselves from, from drying out. Um, but they need to stratify. They need a cold storage period. Um, we generally recommend two to three months. Um, I'm going to have some resources in a second. We did have a couple folks do a study on stratification that's, um, that was published in our magazine, I think last year, that has a little bit more, more info about that. But once the nuts are stratified, they're going to sprout even in cold storage. So, you know, often by March, April, um, you know, if you're up in New England where I am, there's still snow on the ground and the, the radicals have already started to, to push out. Um, and that's pretty typical. Uh, once the radicals have emerged, you just want to try not to shift the nuts too much in storage because they sense gravity and they'll grow down. So if you have a you know, radical that's growing this way and then you put the nut back in the bag and now it's this way, well, then it's going to continue growing down this way. You end up with curved radicals, which that's your future tap root. So that's not, not ideal. Uh, once the nuts are sprouted or even beforehand, you can plant them either outside after the risk of a hard frost or inside in pots, whatever whatever you want to do. It's generally best to plant them, um, you know, the season after you've harvested. Uh, you can get germination of seeds that have been stored for over a year, but um, it's certainly reduced. So if, um, if you're going to use them, you want to use them quickly. They're hard to store long term. Finally, record keeping. Note the tree you're harvesting from, especially if you're going to use these for planting in our, in our program. If you're just going to eat them, do whatever you want. <laughs> but if you're storing them for planting, Note the tree, harvest date, keep good counts of everything. If you were making a controlled frost, keep track of the number of pollination and control bags. Uh, either way, you wanna count how many burrs you got off the tree, how many fertile nuts. Um, and if you harvested multiple trees, keep all of those harvests separate um, and labeled so that you know what you've got when you get back to your house or your facility where you're gonna be sorting through everything. Uh, this is a recording form that we've used for an awfully long time. Um, it still holds up. I send this out to folks. If you need a recording form, let me know. I'm happy to send this. Um, it collects a lot of the same information that we record in our database. Um, and this picture at the bottom here is just showing, um, you know, your, your pile of fertile nuts versus infertile nuts, just to give you another view of what that looks like. Finally, some resources, and I'm going to stop yapping and let Eric take over. Uh, we've got a good fact sheet on uh, harvest and storage on our website. And then there are several um, articles. These are all going to be posted on the Chestnut Chat webpage. I think Sharon, I'm not sure if Sharon has them up already, but um, if she doesn't yet, she will uh, by do. the time the video goes They're up. There. Awesome. These are already on the website. Go look. Yeah. Uh, so there's an article from two years ago on, yeah. on harvesting and storage. There's an article from several years ago where Sarah and I tried different sterilization or um, cleaning methods to see if we could kill chestnuts by putting them even in uh, full strength bleach or full strength uh, hydrogen peroxide. Um, we didn't kill anything, it's still germinated. Um, I'm still a little hesitant to recommend it, but uh, we didn't kill anything. Uh, there's an article on seed stratification, and I didn't cover weevils, but um, they are certainly a thing. Um, they don't typically uh, impact germination success. You know, even if you've got a whole bunch of weevil holes, typically your nuts are going to sprout just fine. But if you're going to eat them, they can be kind of gross. So I've got an article on that as well. So with that, I'm going to pull up Eric's presentation.
And Eric, you just let me know when you want me to forward this for you. Eric is dealing with worse internet than I am today. So I'm going to be his helper. Thank you, Andrew. There you go. Ah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I will start out here. Uh, Kendra mentioned that sometimes people use um, mechanical lifts uh, other than ladders or bucket trucks. So um, we've been using these types of lifts that are shown here for the about since I started about six years ago. And um, we had been uh, renting them, but we finally uh, bought one a few years ago. But we still, if we have a big harvest, we'll use the one we already have and then we'll rent another one. And they're you know, practically identical. Um, you can control these. You can see the, um, the feet. They're up in this picture, but you can set them up, you know, in on a moderate slope. If it's really sloped, um, these things you know, have a system inside where they, where they won't, uh, they won't set up. They won't let you raise the bucket up or anything. But if it's just a slight slope, you can still set these up and use them and they're, um, they're a lot safer than ladders anyway. Um, uh, next slide, please, Kendra. Sorry, can you go to the next one? Thank you. Okay, this is like our kind of our system of harvesting. We use these, no, back to the other one, please. The second one. There we go. So our original system of harvesting. Now to the second, the second slide, please. Thank you. Um, we just kind of strap the uh, bag in the second slide, please. That one. Stop. <laughs> so we 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 just like we just put the bag inside the bucket, and there'll be people inside and we would just harvest the nuts that way and drop them down into these mesh bags that usually refer to them as onion bags. And that became kind of an aggravation. So, um, cause you know, the nuts fall down in the bucket. So we had, um, our research technician, uh, Brandon come up with a better idea for harvesting the nuts. So go to the third slide, please, Kendra. So what he did was he cut the bottom out of like just a regular five gallon bucket and we built this apparatus here. Um, so the bottom's out of that bucket and it's got hooks on the, si on the side where we can hang the bag and we just hang it on the outside of the bucket. Um, go to the next slide, please. So we just hook, a, hook that onion bag right there on the, on the side of that bucket where when you drop the nuts down inside the bucket, they just go down in the bag. And it's hanging outside the bucket, so the people in the bucket, you know, they have more room to move around. Next, please. Next slide, please. So I'll just step back and show how it works there. So you can just drop the, drop the nuts down in there, and then when you get done, see, there it is from the top. Um, just drop them down in there. They catch in the bag and it makes it a lot easier. It seems like a small thing, but it, it's made it a lot more convenient and um, just kind of uh, reduces your stress level when you're when you're harvesting. If you don't, you know, feel like you're dropping them on the ground or anything. And when you get done, you just take it off the bottom, tie it up, and then you write the the tree number and um, the date on the the white part of the bag, and then you just you're done with that tree, hopefully. Next, please. Next one, please. Hmm, I thought there was one in between there. So this is my favorite topic now. I've been researching different kinds of gloves. And these are the kind of gloves we used when I started, just like regular gloves. And you can order these, you know, from Amazon or get them about anywhere. There's like rubber gloves or neoprene. And they're, you know, they protect your fingers from the, from the spines of the burrs, but they're really cumbersome. So then I started looking at different kinds of material. Thanks, Kendra. Um, no, you can go ahead. I started looking at different kinds of material. And I found out that 
nitrile is more puncture resistant than other types of, of uh, rubber or plastic material or whatever. So I got these, these type of gloves which are coated with nitrile. You can order these off Amazon too, or you can sometimes you can find them, but I ordered these off the internet. And they're they're thinner, but they're more impenetrable. The blue ones there, yes. And so we can use these and like use them to when you open the burrs or when you're harvesting the burrs. Um, yes, and I see somebody mentioned latex. These are not latex or nitrile. Um, and latex is also less puncture resistant than nitrile, so. It's, but you have to, you know, look carefully, look and see what you're getting. You know, sometimes it's hard to tell what kind of material they're made out of. And so the next slide, please, Kendra. So I also looked at since a lot of people use um, leather gloves, I started looking at different types of leather. And you know, nowadays you can find leather that's like deer skin, goat skin, uh, pig skin, cow hide. Then I found these that are buffalo hide or bison, really. And bison hide says on the on the package it said more puncture resistant than other types of leather. So I said that's a good idea. <laughs> so I got some uh, some of these just the other day, and I also got some for some of our staff here. I'm gonna try these out first time this year. So in, in talking about this, though, I also talked to. Um, Kendra about what she uses and she uses nitrile gloves and like doubles them up there they are and as I said they're more puncture resistant and these are much more um you know they're more fit more uh, get more dexterity and um, they're not so bulky as other gloves so my idea this year and what I'm recommending to people is you get a pair of these that fit kind of tightly on your hand and then you put I'm gonna use the, the leather gloves on top of these. I'm gonna see how that works. Because yes, things do work better, but when you're harvesting tens of thousands of, of burrs, just about anything, eventually you get a few burrs and a few spines in your fingers, no matter how hard you try. So this is my new technique for this year is to have a nitrile glove overlaying with a bison hide glove, which, uh, We'll see how that works, and maybe I'll let people know the next time we have a, a chestnut chat about this topic. We'll do a reprise, Eric, just to hear about your glove success. Yeah, I'm, gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you all about it. Next, please. Yep, I lost my, where'd it go? There. Uh, this is, we're just up in, we're up in the tree, or up in the bucket, you can see the corner of it down there at the lower right hand. Um, and this is Dan McKinnon. He is the director of farm operations here. And this is just, we're just harvesting out of the top of the tree. And as Kendra said, we try to get into the uh, harvest and that's before they fall off. We wait until you start seeing that seam split. And, you know, of course we have to do that, but I do know that if you harvest them early before the seam splits and then you're storing them, um, what we usually do is try to keep them fairly wet or in a humid environment because if they you harvest them before the seam splits and then you just let them dry out too long, which sometimes happens when you, you know, have thousands and thousands of burrs and you can't get to them really quickly. They're really hard to open. We end up having to cut them open or even saw them open. So when you do harvest your burrs, try to um, open them and get the nuts out before they dry, they start to dry, start to dry out. Because if usually when they dry out, they'll split. If they don't, then it's very hard to open them. <laughs> Next, please. You can go to the next one. Thanks. Oh, this is just when we harvest them, we just we just throw them in the back of the truck and haul them back. Um, we, as we said, we label the number, the tree number. You want to keep very close track of that. Um, cause we use them in different research and things like that. And you want to know which tree they came from. And then we just put the date so we can, and we can try to um, open them, shut them, um, usually within 48 hours of harvest, as I said, so they don't get too much chance to dry out. Next, please.
So we hang them, we have a barn, obviously, and we have this big rack that we try to hang them up, and we hang them up in in order of harvest so we can try to get them, uh, get them shut in order. And we usually like spray them down a little bit, um, either every day or every other day to try to keep them moist um, while they're while they're in on this rack. Um, but this is like pretty typical of what we have. Usually this time of year, we've already done some harvesting, but it's been a little late this year. Um, so we haven't harvested anything here at Meadowview yet. Probably start next week. Um, but usually we'll get between 40 and 80,000 nuts out of our harvest. Um, so we have a whole area there to hang up the birds until we're ready. Next, please. Just a picture of them. We spread them out on a table. It's basically as Kendra described. We just usually have uh, all the birds. We count all the birds, count all the, the nuts, um, store them the way she described. Um, but I think this is this is a nice picture. Um, you can see a lot of them are brown, and a lot of them are still green. So it's it would be nice if you could get them all, and they were all just really nice and easy to pop open and all already split like the one there towards the middle. But usually you will end up having to like cut or pry, pry them open a little bit. Some of them will be difficult, some of them will be easy to open. Next, please. We have some volunteers. You can see they're using the, the, the nitrile type gloves. To, we have some volunteers from uh, the local university came in um, the, the plant biology class came and helped us uh, harvest uh, last year and uh, the year before. And uh, we see the bird, all the birds there go in the trash can and in the nuts we store them, store them in our cooler, which I'll show you a little bit later. Next, please. That's some other volunteers. Some people like leather, some people like rubber, do people just like different kind of gloves. Next, please. I skip that one. Uh, this is our outdoor cooler, and we purchased this probably about four or five years ago. And so we um, store them all about 35 degrees at uh, 35 degrees. It um, keeps them at that temperature. Um, you don't want to freeze them. Um, from personal experience, if you do freeze them. A lot of them will still germinate, but you just get lesser germination rates. Like usually it's around 90%. If you freeze them, it might be just 60 or 70% um, on average. If you freeze them for a long period of time, if they're just frozen for a day or two or something, and then they're kept at above freezing for most of the winter, they'll be fine. But if you keep them frozen for a long, you know, all the way through the winter, you kept them in your freezer like all winter, probably you would have very low germination. Next, please. It's just the inside of the cooler. And we have little, little labels um, uh, on the bottom. See, one of them says W3. That means that is from block three on the Wagner farm. So we keep them uh, stored in there by eat the different parts of the farm that they come from. That way we can keep track of what we have. And if people want like open pollinated nuts from a certain farm, we can know which one they want. It just makes it convenient, you know, to find stuff. And then if we have um, control pollinated stuff, I put that on the shelves in the back. And that's like for pure Americans that we sometimes have or um, control pollinations that we do here on the farm. Next. Uh, that's the end. So um, I hope that was helpful. And I guess at this point, we'll probably take the questions. I think Sarah's gonna field the questions for us. I am, if I can get my mouse to work. Hold on. There we go. Yes, we have lots of questions actually. Um, great job guys, thank you. Uh, lots of questions here. I'm gonna start with uh, the, a couple of people have uploaded this question from Frank. And, and Eric, you started to address this uh, toward the end of your presentation, but let's let's uh, hit it more explicitly. Um, obviously, in nature, nuts are not stored under this narrow range of conditions. How do any survive and reproduce in nature if storage conditions need to be in such a narrow range? Uh, what does nature know that we don't? 
Well, I think what actually can happen with plant tissues is if they're exposed to ambient temperatures with the, more of those freeze thaw cycles, they actually build up sugars that can protect the, um, the tissues. And so, you know, if a squirrel buries a nut in the ground in Vermont, it's going to freeze. Like <laughs> they're not burying it below the frost line, but the nuts get to ramp up to that temperature. It's not, you know, you don't go from a 60 degree, degree day in September to 35 degrees. Uh, you know, it's, it, it goes through a lot of cycling so that by the time you do have consistently frozen temperatures, um, you know, the nuts can handle that. They've got the, the right um, composition of sugars to, to sort of protect their tissues so that they can germinate in the spring. Um, at least that's my best understanding. I don't know, Sarah or Eric, if you have anything to add on that. Well, and I think Eric touched on it too, in, in terms of, you know, if it freezes for a day or two, maybe a week at 31 or 30 degrees, um, you're not going to have complete failure of germination. And in fact, if you have a bag of a bunch of nuts, you've got more insulatory, you know, uh, factors. Um, and then, you know, if a squirrel buries it, it's insulated somewhat in the ground. So it, it's not going to be frozen all the time. It's going through these freeze thaw cycles. So versus a freezer, which is frozen, <laughs> you know, yeah. and the embryo dies. Um, so I think, you know, uh, when we say narrow conditions, we recommend these because that's your best chance for success of all the nuts. And nature doesn't care about all the nuts surviving, right? They only care about a few um, mm -hmm. surviving. That's why trees produce, you know, tens of thousands of nuts because they know that over time, you know, not everything's going to gonna make it. So, you know, our narrow range of conditions are if you want all of your nuts to germinate or, you know, the maximum amount of nuts to germinate and, and to get into production, you know, that's why these recommendations are there. And nature doesn't care about that. <laughs> yeah. And my refrigerator still freezes stuff. Like they, there's a cold spot. So, you know, it's again, another reason to check it every once in a while, but that doesn't, hasn't, you know, you get a frozen block for, um, you know, a week or so. That doesn't seem to cause too much of an issue. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, there are a lot of questions here. Okay, Ken says, um, if you snip the branch tips to collect burrs, are you cutting off some of next year's flowers? I think possibly, um, but I've never seen it reduce much in terms of the, you know, the, the next year's flowering um, or nut set. I don't know, Eric, you guys, do you guys clip I, or do you just break I, them off? We just pull, we just pull them off unless like I said, sometimes we can't set that lift up. It's it's on a slope. So then we'll get the pole pruners and we'll clip we'll clip them out. Um, but when we do do that, I'm just speaking anecdotally. I think you have. I think it does put a lot of stress on the tree to like clip the the whole branch off, and you you might have less flowering next year. It'll usually still produce and still flower, but I do think it puts a little bit more stress on the tree for the next year's growth than if you just take the burrs off by hand and don't clip the branch off. Yeah, we were doing a lot more clipping, at least, you know, within the chapter programs when we were doing more controlled crosses because you'd have, you know, you just clip yeah. the whole bag. Um, and there's not really an easier way around that unless you're gonna take them off on the tree. So, yeah. but you know, we, we pollinated trees, you know, two, three years in a row and it was usually not an issue to find enough flowers to pollinate. So I never noticed it reducing flowering a lot, but I think some of those flower buds do form on the branch ships. Um, I don't think it's worth worrying about too much. If you, you know, if you have to go to a hassle of renting a lift, I would rather just, I would, I would just use the pole pruner because the, the reason we ended up buying a lift is because every year it got more and more expensive to rent one, you know, like, $500 more every year. It's, it's like everything else. It, it goes up faster than our um, our uh, donation. The, the price of thing goes up faster than our don donation level <laughs> increases. So we ended up um, just purchasing one. And uh, mostly we, we try not to rent one because they are getting so expensive. It may be better in some other places. Or if you know somebody that has one, that's always nice too. Well, uh, talking about the towable lifts, uh, Brad, uh, I have a couple questions, one from Brad and one from ML Allen. So, um, uh, Eric, talking about that uh, box and bucket setup that Brandon made, uh, does that apparatus change the weight differential on the crane, or do you have to worry about that? I haven't really thought about that question. I do know that, that sometimes if you're on, a, uh, if you're in an area 
And if you extend the bucket way out, you know, if you extend out 50 feet, it'll start beeping at you and it'll stop you as soon as you start, you know, getting into the danger zone. It's got all kinds of safety features mixed in with it. So if it starts to, if it starts beeping at you, you just retract the bucket. So I'm thinking if the weight differential is off, it probably wouldn't even let you raise the bucket up to begin with, you know, because it has so many features in it. We've never had a problem with it, though. We've been using it for the last couple of years. Good. Um, I had a couple questions about when, how early can you harvest? So someone says, how early can you harvest? And then also Jack says, um, I collected about two dozen green burrs off a tree. They're fairly large. If they're infertile, will the burrs still open up? Hmm. Well, as far as how early, I mean, I don't know. I mean, don't harvest them in August, probably. <laughs> um, you know, I think just, you know, what I usually do is if I'm harvesting early is I just try to crack into one of them and just see what it looks like. Um, but, you know, in my experience, as long as they don't dry out, like Eric said, you know, I store harvested burrs in a walking cooler. I usually throw a few apples in with them just so there's a little ethylene. I don't know if it actually helps, but it makes me feel like I'm doing something. No. Um, and they don't dry out in a cooler. Um, they also ripen really slowly because it's cold, um, but it's the most secure place where I have enough space to store stuff. Um, but in my experience, they'll, they'll ripen um, as long as they're still inside the burr. So, you know, I think if you harvested now, I would just let them go and, you know, don't let them dry out, cross your fingers. Um, open them. And they're white. I'm sure Kendra is saying, you know, they'll be white if you, the nuts will be white or light colored. They turn brown. Even if you take them out of the burr and just store them normally, after a few days or weeks, they'll turn brown and look like, look like normal. And I think they germinate normally. So. Yeah, I've never had a problem with white nuts not turning brown or germinating. You know, I think as long as they're about full size, you know, I think they've got enough yeah. oomph to, to, finish off whatever they need, they're doing at the end of, of ripening. And Sarah, what was the second part of that question? I'm sorry. It, it was if, if you have nuts and, and if you have burrs, if you have and the nuts are infertile, they still open up? It depends. Sometimes um, they either open and have infertile nuts or they just dry out and then you go through an awful lot of effort to pry them open to get nothing out of them. <laughs> Not that I've done that, but... <laughs> Um, and then a couple of questions about timing. So um, I think folks, some folks are, are um, pulling burrs off now. Um, so for example, in California, I think that they're harvesting stuff now. I, know, I think in uh, Ohio, they're waiting till next week, which is what Eric, I think you said, is about yeah. the same here in PA, mm -hmm. probably next week. Probably earlier. I know, earlier. I know Tom's, probably, Tom's yeah, already pulled. In the South, I guess it would be about now or earlier. So South yeah. of here, we're in Virginia. And uh, usually it seemed like almost every year we start harvesting about September 10th. I don't know if that's coincidental or not, but this year it's later than usual. Um, Tom, Tom was pulling stuff off in Northern Virginia, but they were all tight still, I think, um, and, and white, but he was trying to get them off the, so, you know, you can do it. Um, so that's, that's another, so I had a couple questions and you, you sort of addressed this, but, you know, how do you open burrs that, that are stubborn and won't open? Um, you know, Eric, I totally agree with you. I would much rather have a burr that's starting to split and open that's, and, and open it while I'm um, up in a bucket or, or up on the ladder even and get it right into a bag rather than waiting for it to open or, or collect green burrs and, and have to pry them open with pliers. Someone did mention pliers and that's- I've even had to saw them open. Have you really? <laughs> oh, wow. I usually just stab at them with my Felcos, like, or just like clip a little bit just so I could get in there because it you know once you can get into the seam you can usually convince them to open along that seam but sometimes especially if they've dried out you know the whatever tissue someone with better horticultural vocab than me might know what that's called but whatever's underneath the spines but um, outside the fuzzy part of the burr that part can get really hard um, once it dries out. So getting through that, Eric, I'm not surprised you've used a saw. I've never been that dedicated. dedicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've used pliers and, and pruners um, and opened it up. And I've, I've had to sacrifice a few nuts when, yeah. I, when I get in there with the pliers, but it's worth it to, you know, if you got three and you get two out of the three, that's, that's fine. Um, Colton asks, will an isolated tree still produce a large quantity of unfertilized burrs? I understand that they do not self isn't this a huge in producing such large quantities? 
Yeah, I mean, if they don't get pollinated, they still go through the whole process. They, they flower like crazy because they're hoping to get pollinated. And, you know, they don't know there's no pollen out there when they're flowering. So they, you know, they produce the number of flowers that's appropriate for the size tree and the health of the tree. And if they don't get pollinated, they still go through that process of producing burrs that are infertile, which is a bummer. It does seem, but, it does seem yeah. like a waste. Yeah. Um, Alan, Alan Nichol says, when bagging flowers for control, hi Alan, when bagging flowers for controlled pollination, do you get insects in the pollination bags? And if so, have you ever used any insecticide to control insects in the bags? And do you have any recommendations for that? Earwigs. Just earwigs. Always earwigs. They always and usually earwigs. Not, not so much at, at pollination time, but they're always in the bags when I harvest. Um, I've never known, you know, Eric, you've probably done more of this, but I've never seen insects cause a problem for any of the developing birds, so I've never worried about them. Um, you know, usually at harvest or at pollination time, you know, there's some bees, there's some beetles, you know, there's all kinds of things attracted to the pollen. Um, but I don't think any of them eat developing flowers or burrs or anything. So. No, nothing that I'd worry about or nothing that requires treatment. And earwigs are just um, icky, but. <laughs> yeah, they, give you, they give you the hippie jeebies. Yeah, um, so speaking of insects, uh, insects that, that affect the nuts, Bruce Levine, hi Bruce, asks, what about weevil treatment? Um, yeah, so I did mention, um, I, or at least put a link up in my, my slides to uh, a one pager that Sarah actually wrote like back in 2013, 2008, something like that, a while ago. Um, weevils are around, you know, especially if you have a site where the trees have been producing burrs for a long time and viable nuts. That seems to be what draws them in. Um, and their life cycle, you know, they lay their eggs in the developing flower, which becomes the burr, and then the weevil little larva uh, chews its way out of the nut and into the soil um, in the fall and, um, and over winters. And so you get this sort of cyclical thing that, that doesn't go away. Um, you get, you know, good sanitation can help keep them at bay. Um, a heat water, a hot water bath, I think at like 120 will kill the larva if you don't want them to be living in your nuts, especially if you're gonna eat them. Um, but I haven't seen that they really cause an issue for germination. Um, you know, Eric, you guys have a pretty healthy weevil population. Do you guys treat mm. your seeds? No, but they do, they do crawl out when they get cold. If you put them oh, yeah, in, you know, I, you'll I find a bag and it'll have It's usually full of them. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, if you have like a, a turtle or something or a pet frog or something, I guess you could feed them to them. But I do notice that they crawl. <laughs> they, they, they crawl out when it gets down, you know, to the temperature that we store them out, which is about 34 degrees. They just seem to want to get out and try and find a warmer climate to live in. But I don't think they affect the germination that much. If you do oh, have a week. Yeah, heart Harmony Dalglish published a paper, and, and maybe we can put that up on the website, that, that showed, uh, what's that? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, she, she showed that um, uh, there was some uh, decrease in germination based on weevil infestation. I haven't noticed a significant decrease. It might a little bit, but I haven't noticed a significant issue, um, except in really old Asiatic plantations. So there's a, you know, 100 plus year old Japanese plantation at Hershey Cemetery in central PA, and those nuts are mush because there are mm. like a hundred weevils in them. And, mm. and the nuts are, you know, huge because Japanese nuts are huge. So, you know, if you have a huge weevil infestation, it's going to be a problem, but you know, no amount of heat treating is going to solve that. Um, yeah, I have but, heard yeah. guinea fowl will eat them too. You know? Yeah, so they you, will. You know, if you're trying to manage for them, you know, you can get, the, get some critters to help eat the bugs. And, and so Bruce, Bruce has made a couple comments, which I appreciate. So Bruce says weevils are edible, which is true if you're into that sort of thing. And some people are, I'm not. Well, even if you heat treat them, you're still going to eat them. I mean, yeah. they're in there. <laughs> and then uh, Bruce also mentions as a uh, pathologist himself, some nut rotting fungi like trichoderma grow on the burrs. So if you see mold on a burr, don't harvest it. If you see a green burr that has brown or black streaks of dead spines, that's a sign of fungus inside the burr. So thanks, Bruce. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Richard Kramer asks, for two trees to pollinate, do both trees need to be mature? They just need to be flowering. Um, yeah. Some trees flower at like two years of age and some trees won't flower until they're 15 or 20. Uh, it's, I think, more an issue of if they're getting enough light, if they're, you know, 
happy or stressed out. Stressed out trees will flower earlier. Um, but you need at least one of them to have female flowers and the other one to have male flowers. I mean, they, they produce both on the same tree, but sometimes they'll produce male flowers for a few years before they make very many females. Um, ML asks, uh, uh, Bruce, um, is trichoderma a beneficial fungus and good to have on seed? So Bruce, I don't know, but maybe you can, you can address that, but I doubt it. I'm going to say probably not. <laughs> um, Brad Price asks, Eric, can you do this one? Is, is that towable lift at all maneuverable or positionable by two people if you unhooked it from the hitch or is it basically only movable with a vehicle or a tractor? Yeah, you have to have a vehicle. We pulled it behind our truck, um, and not not with the tractor, but usually we you know we have a tractor, so we, we use the tractor to move it. But yeah, it's not. You can't drag it around with two people, even on flat ground. It's, <laughs> you'll end up hurting your back pretty bad, yeah. probably. <laughs> I, I like um, you know if you do rent one, and 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 it might be um, inordinately expensive, but we've we've worked with a lot of. Um, electric companies that have the self powered lifts and those are a lot oh, easier yeah. to move around than the, um, than the towable booms. But um, let's see, Brian, Brian McLean. Hi, Brian. He says uh, 10 to one peat to water ratio. Is that by volume or by weight? Volume. I use a coffee cup. Okay. 10 coffee cups of peat, one coffee cup of water, whatever you got. <laughs> yeah. And you'll okay. still get some mold, I think, even if you store them in peat. I mean, it might inhibit it yeah. some, but a lot of times we still get mold. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, at every stage where you have a chance to increase your cleanliness and reduce mold, you know, the better. You know, everything you can do through the whole process to keep things from getting moldy, um, the better. Um, Eric, you're using those bison gloves. ML Allen asks, are any of the bison gloves sold by indigenous producers? No, not that I know of. I bought them at Rural King. Uh, a Rural King store opened up down in Bristol, which is not too far from here. And I hadn't been there before. I just happened to see them. Um, they had all, they had all, that's what got me to thinking about it because they had all different kinds of leather gloves from different different animals <laughs> and that one was one that was unusual to me so but i don't know i bet there would be um but i did want to mention back to gloves so i have three cats and they have claws and when i took them to one of whom is very mean um you know that johnny cash song mean eyed cat that's seek yeah. anyway they have kevlar puncture resistant gloves you know that come up to here um for dealing with cats so that was what i was going to try this year it was kevlar puncture resistant. It might have a, a dexterity kind of issue. Like almost like going out gloves, you know. Yeah, right. To... <laughs> they also make gloves for law enforcement that are for searching vehicles because they uh, yeah. encounter hypodermic needles. Uh-huh. But they're super expensive. You know, they're like some of them are like three or four hundred dollars. Oh wow. And but they're, you know, impenetrable because it's such a risk for them when they're if they're basically say just law enforcement personnel and stuff like that, you can buy them. But um, yeah, they're for for that kind of hazardous duty. Yeah, yeah. So lots lots of um, lots of options out there. So Bruce Bruce got back to us in the chat. He says uh, no um, trichoderma may suppress other fungi, um, but it also greatly reduces germination on infected trees. So not not useful to have on burrs. Um, well, we got a couple more minutes. Let's take a few more questions. Um, so Robbie Shaw asks, if you freeze nuts for later culinary use, do you, oh, and just so you guys know, on October 16th, so not next time, but the time after that, we're going to have roasting and cooking with chestnuts. So we might come back to this question, but if you freeze nuts for later culinary use, do you freeze in brown shell or shell the nuts and then freeze the raw nuts or cook nuts and then freeze? I think you could probably do whatever you want. I would probably get them out of the shell and then freeze them. That'd be easier. Um, you know, I think the easiest thing would probably be like hack them in half, blanch them so that they pop out of the shell and then throw them in the freezer. Yeah. Um, that's that's but, usually what I, when I find them um, commercially. That's yeah. I, I don't them. usually let them last long enough to freeze them. <laughs> yeah. Same here. Um, so an anonymous attendee requests, and so the, Eric, this is for you, on the seeds that TAF sends out, can you mark the or data for 
You just cut uh, out I lost you there. Uh, you cut out on me. Can, can you put the collection data on the bags for the seeds that we send out? Mm, that would add a lot of time if we had to do that for everybody because we take them out, put them in the, you know, the smaller bag. Unless somebody gets four seeds, we just, well, they should say the tree name on them, like where they came from. But other than that, we haven't been putting any data on well, them. As, as long as you have the tree name, the tree code, no, and no the tree year. Yeah, if, yeah. So, so, so if you, as a, as a person who receives the nuts, if you have the tree code and the year that you got it, we can look all that information up for you. But yeah, I think it would be too much to be able to put on all the bags. Um, like if you, so I mean, right. I don't know what kind of information you're wanting beyond, beyond the tree code, like the date or something. That's what like it sounds like. But yeah. No. I, that's probably you, that's what I I'm thinking, but I think this I think this person should get back in touch with us about what what they're what they're after. Okay. Um, all right, uh, Frank. Hi, Frank. Uh, most nuts in forest get buried in leaf litter. How effective is this in controlling the temperature of nuts over the winter? Are there other effects of leaf litter? I mean, it's I mean, here's so, usually they're they're lower. Usually they're actually in the soil. I mean, when when I've seen this up in Maine, you know, we 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 see caches, and they're about half an inch maybe in the ground. Yeah. So not in the litter. It's below. Yeah, um, they're usually in the ground because the blue jays like pack them in too, and yeah. they're you know because they're really good. I think you know squirrels and blue jays are probably the best planters. Um, so it's certainly going to provide some insulation. The snow provides some insulation, and again, I think just experiencing ambient temperatures they're not as susceptible to um to hard freeze if they get ramped up um so jay hi jay he asks um should you put them in the cold sooner than two to three months prior to planting i don't know what that means should you put them in the cold sooner than two to three months prior to planting jay can I'm not you quite sure not. what that means either but you know i think you want to follow, like, I mean, the whole thing with stratification is if they did fall off the tree, they're getting exposed to cold temperatures over the winter. Um, so, you know, you can't, you don't want to stratify them before they're ripe, but once they're ripe, you can start stratifying them. Yeah. Um, you know, if you don't do it, you know, if you just leave them out at room temperature, they're probably going to dry out. Um, so I would still get them yeah. in cold storage just because of that um, lack of fat in the nut. Maybe that means, maybe that means I, how I, long you have you know, to, oh, sorry, Eric. I don't think you have to stratify them for like 60 days. I think there've been experiments done where they, you know, trying to grow them in a greenhouse, you know, like in December and they'll still germinate, but they don't necessarily have to be stratified for 60 days. Although it probably would be better if they were. Yeah, I know Bruce and um, and Laura Barth, who was at Meadowview, did a good study on that where they tried different levels of stratification. There's an article that we have a link to uh, from last last year, um, so you can check that out. But um, you know, you can leave them in the cold or in the refrigerator until you're ready to plant. You know, it's um, pretty cold up here. We're usually not planting until the middle of May, um, or even sometimes until late May, June. Um, so you know, you can leave them in there longer <laughs> if you need to. That, that was his question. So, so Jay clarified, he said, uh, you said two to three months in cold storage, but does longer hurt? Um, no, just by, yeah. You know, the longer they're in the fridge, the longer the radicals are going to get. But I mean, you can even leave them in the fridge for a year and, you know, you won't get as good germination. Um, but, you know, if they don't get moldy, they will still come up or at least some of them will. Um, and so Bruce clarified too, uh, the nuts don't need cold, they don't need cold to germinate, they need to rest for a period of time. So they'll rot if they're not cold, keep them cold until you're ready to plant. And that's, that's what I, what I say. Um, Alan says he's had good luck storing nuts in fresh hardwood dust, but the new band saw is cut so fine, it's usually dry by the time he can get it. Uh, fair enough. Uh, Brian hmm. McLean, have you ever heard of a peace offering for squirrels? I read somewhere, maybe in Virginia, that they put a pot of commercial chestnuts at the foot of trees to redirect the critters away from the burrs. I've never tried it. I've heard it, but I haven't tried it. Um, I usually just try to get there before they do, yeah. <laughs> before the yeah. burrs open. It seems easier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're going anyway. Um, 
All right, let's see. Plus, I wouldn't want to waste that many commercial nuts. I'd want to eat them. All right, right, right. <laughs> Um, oh, Frank again. All right. Hi, Frank. Uh, in nature, very few nuts of any nut tree, like oak, walnut, hickory, etc., ever grow into trees into the canopy. By collecting and getting 90% of nuts to sprout, are we effectively selecting trees that would never have survived in the water or in the water, in the wild? They don't survive in the water at all. <laughs> in the wild. Yeah, I mean, potentially. I I mean, I think that's like an evolutionary biologist yeah. question. <laughs> I mean, I think that, you know, the tree produces a lot of nuts with all of them having the ability to sprout. There's a lot of things that go wrong. So it's not that they're... There's no selection to, there. Yeah, it's not that they're programmed to not sprout. It's that they get eaten or the little tree that sprouts gets eaten or it never gets enough sun and it dies. So, um, you know, I think, you know, you see when you pot them up some of them are not very good. You know, you get little teeny ones that put up like multiple stems and never do anything. You know, those, we, those get weeded out regardless. So I think, yeah, I wouldn't be too worried about that, I guess. We usually, you yeah. know, we have been plant, you know, sowing them. We don't plant the, the seeds anymore in the field. We sow them in pots. So if one comes up and it's just a tiny little sprout, no matter how much you try and care for it, you know, we just don't use it for anything. It's just thrown away. So, you know, the wheat get weeded out <laughs> yeah. regardless. Eventually, right. the, the losers get weeded out uh, no matter what. Yeah. Um, ML Allen asks, uh, this is off topic, it is, um, but how do you feed your trees? Um, we, don't go for it, Eric. <laughs> we don't We don't fertilize them. Anymore. I mean, we fertilize like the progeny test for the first couple of years and we use Osmocote, you know, in the, in the field when they're, you know, yay high or whatever for like the second and third year of growth. We just use a time to release Osmocote, if you know what that is, it's little pellets. I use it releases the fertilizer over two or three months. Um, you know, that's what we've been doing since I've been here. Yeah, that's what I use it for potted plants. You know, I'll... I may water them with mere acid um, to fertigate a little bit too, just so they have something more easily accessible. Um, and then usually I give everyone a scoop of Osmocote for the season. Um, and in the orchards, you know, at, we soil test. Usually we try not to plant on sites that have really poor nutrition. Um, so it's a little hit or miss as to whether or not orchard managers um, choose to fertilize or not. Um, some do, some don't. Trees tend to tend to do okay unless they're on a marginal site. Um, what do you do with the old burrs? Pile them up along the fence line. <laughs> Just have big piles of burrs. Let them. Yeah. Let I go on the trash. We don't have a place to compost them. Forces. They're really hard to compost. They don't break down. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I guess if the, pile, if the pile gets too big, we'll start throwing them in the dumpster. <laughs> throw, throw them on the burn pile too, I guess. You could burn them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but, but yeah, uh, they don't compost. You will get um, burrs forever or not burrs, yeah. the spines will last forever yeah um and then i had another question that came in over email so everybody's using all kinds of technology um uh is the size of the nuts relevant um uh john has burrs with nuts nuts the size of little fingernails um i haven't found that it matters too i mean some trees if they're stressed out produce small nuts some produce big nuts um you know the size of the nut I think correlates pretty strongly to the size of your initial seedling, like sort of the initial growth. I mean, when you pot up a Chinese nut, which is, you know, usually pretty big, you get this huge tall thing that finally produces some leaves at the top. Um, but I think over time, I haven't noticed that, that, you know, that a tree that produced smaller nuts than another stays consistently small. On the short term, it makes a difference. Like if you're trying to grow them up for that small stem test, you have know, one, family that has really small and one that has nuts that are about the size of a Chinese nut. So you're just growing them for like three or four months before you're inoculating them. It's all, all happens in the greenhouse. Well, that family that had the small nuts, they're going to be smaller seedlings, you know, in three or four months. Now in three or four years, it'd probably even out if you planted them in the field. But yeah, it kind of, it does make a difference in the real short term. I agree. All right. Well, we cleared the slate. Wonderful. Um, excellent questions. Great presentations, guys. 
in two weeks on October 2nd, we are going to invite Erin Lazat from Michigan State University, and she's going to tell us about pests and pathogens of chestnut. Um, so hope to see you again in two weeks and have a great weekend. See everybody. Thank you all. Bye.